Well, I'd always been interested in music tech ever since I was a, a schoolboy. I had my little geeky crew of friends and we ran a little radio station at our school using the school intercom. And then we, one day there was some disco equipment outside the third year tutor's office and we asked him what it was. He said, oh, the youth club is throwing that out. So we offered him five pounds for it and we, we bought this equipment and we started doing the old disco at school. And so we learned how to sort of wire things up and yeah, connect amps and speakers and other stuff. And then also I, I was building a synthesizer with one of my friends at that time out of an electronics magazine. So this was the mid 70s and the punk music was happening and also certain artists were using sort of the attitude and the do it yourself, the DIY attitude of a punk but bringing in electronic instruments and Daniel Miller who later formed Mute Records, one of the most successful independent labels, put out a pioneering record called Robert Rental and the Normal and we bought this seven inch record and thought well you know we could do this with a synthesizer. So that was quite inspiring. And later I was at college with a, a really close group of friends who are still my, my closest friends actually. We really got into uh, these dance music, black music actually, and particularly records that were coming in on import from New York, which were the early hip hop records. And records like Grandmaster Flash, Adventures on the Wheels of Steel, was a really mind blowing slab of sound this vinyl 12 inch, it was an incredible sort of sonic assault really and we listened to it and thought that, how on earth is he doing this? We've got to work this out. And so we as a crew kind of really got into early hip hop culture. So this is the beginning of the 80s now. And you know, people say the 80s is sort of notorious for having terrible music and, but we had great music in the 80s. And so hip hop was coming in, electro was coming in, records like Planet Rock from Soul Sonic Force, and it was a very inspiring time. And so we were inspired to buy this culture and wanted to find out as much as possible about it and learn to do it. There weren't very many sources of information at that time. There was no kind of how to scratch videos on YouTube or really very few sources of information. So I'd been living in Spain for a year, DJing and having a great time, but I realized if I wanted to do anything with DJing and with the sort of scratching and mixing techniques I was learning, that it really had to be in London. So I came back at the end of 1986 and uh, two of my close friends from Oxford that I'd been living with let me stay in our old flat and so I set up my turntables there and this was above a butcher's shop in Seven Sisters Road, um, the meat, meat market. And so that's partly where the name Cold Cuts came from. Apart from the fact that it was very cold there as well as the landlord decided not to repair the heating. <laughs> so yeah, and I started uh, putting music together using cassette deck and turntables to start off with. And that became the first cold cut record, Say Kids What Time Is It, which we released at the beginning of 1987. And there was a rather marvellous time in London in the mid-80s that I think was a, a crucial time for the genesis of what later became the dance music scene, which is a, a lot of young people, particularly in London, of all different races and colours and backgrounds and cultures, all getting together to, to party and you know, come together and get off and with each other, enjoy each other and get into the music. And so there were lots of parties going on in London, often in illegal venues. You know, we, the warehouse scene involved often taking over a building that wasn't licensed just for a night and doing a party there. And I think part of the success, I would say, of London as a, a, a well-integrated cultural stew pot came out of that time when the youth realised, you know, all this racism and crap, we're not really down with that. We're more into having a good time with each other. I think that was a, a crucial change, perhaps, in the, the consciousness of the capital. So, there were some other records coming in from the States that were using cut-up techniques, uh, hip-hop techniques, 
to sample and chop together lots of different sources of uh, sound from different records and particularly Double D and Steinsky, these two guys from New York, made some records which were incredible collages of film, bits of spoken word from the film, rock and roll records, hip hop records, electro, funk, and made these very skillful, funky and humorous montages and we wanted to do something like that. So in a way that kind of was analogous to what was going on in London with the fusions of all these different sorts of music. And uh, I think it was Jay Strongman, who was a key DJ at that time, who said that our first record, Say Kids What Time Is It, was the first one to put that party on plastic and give London culture and identity on a record. So that was 1987. The unity of the ninja sound is in the diversity that all our artists are quite different in their characters. They're a sort of collection of oddballs that we've assembled, probably because John and I are oddballs ourselves, and we know that people gravitated towards us that liked what we were doing and appreciated a, a certain sort of alternative and freewheeling attitude which is different to a lot of what you'll find in the music business. John and I, having been through the sort of sausage machine, actually, of the music business, um, were determined that if we formed a label, we would not act the same way to our artists because we hadn't enjoyed that experience. We thought it was possible to do it in a better, in a fairer way. So I think that brought a lot of good people to us, actually. John and I were releasing records ourselves and just literally selling them out of John's escort van around the shops of London. It was real DIY stuff, you know, we just pressed 500 copies. But actually then we started selling 1,000 or 2,000 copies and we got picked up by an independent label called Big Life. And so we had a, developed a relationship with them and out of that came our work with Yaz. We did Doctor in the House, then we did The Only Way Is Up, which was you know, suddenly we had a number one record, which was pretty exciting. I well remember listening to the top 40, and it was the only way you could find out what your position was. And we worked out, as it counted down, damn, we must be number one. And we were. And we did this track, uh, People Hold On, with Lisa Stansfield as well. Um, but we kind of fell out with Big Life in the end. They, you know, looking back, perhaps we were rather ignorant and naive, but... Um, we wanted to do our own thing and not be told what to do. And there was a lot of pressure on us to sort of crank out another hit record, ideally along the lines of what had gone before. John and I didn't feel like doing that. So uh, in the end, Big Life got bought by another label um, and that increased the pressure on us to sort of conform and be part of the machine. And so when we went to Japan in uh, 1990, we were on tour with Norman Cook we became Fat Boy Slim later, and you know, that was a real slice of uh, new cultural stimulation. An enormous amount has changed in the last 30 years as regards the, the technology to make music, but in a way, you know, a lot of the techniques are quite similar, it's just the technology has facilitated them. So you know, we still have multi-track recorders where you can build up a track by laying down different layers of sound and then mixing them to find the right balance. And I think Dark Side of the Moon was one of the first albums that was kind of really a studio album, couldn't have been made live. And that kind of approach to making music still goes on, except now instead of having a massive two-inch thick 24 track, which was a very expensive bit of kit. I mean, even just the tapes used to cost 100 quid each, I think. Um, and these huge machines, you needed a big studio, you needed a lot of money to do that. Now you can have a 24 track recorder on your laptop for a couple of hundred pounds, and even the software to operate it, you can find free versions which are pretty good, um, as you can with other electronic music instruments, synthesizers, drum machines, 
you can have a lot of that in software now. Even if you do want the hardware, the hardware is a lot cheaper. I mean, our first sample was, was made by Casio and was a kind of, I think, about 30 or 40 pounds, little plastic toy, but actually you could use it as a musical instrument. Um, so that's the production of music has become a lot easier because the barriers, really the cost barriers to getting the tools that you need to do that have come right down. And yeah, we, we jumped on that at an early stage and really sampling took off. The two crucial inventions were the sampler and the sequencer. And you can trace their roots back for many decades before the 80s, but it, it was at the end of the 80s that they became cheap and affordable. And this really unleashed things. And the, the other main change since then, of course, is the internet. And I was early onto that because I, in the mid 70s, I read a lot of science fiction books. And I read The Selfish Gene by Richard Dawkins, which kind of made the connect between DNA, i.e. biological code, and computer code. And it also showed how you could model certain aspects of behavior using game theory, using computer software. I became fascinated by this, so I, I taught myself to program, and that was my entry into, into computer programming. I would never say, don't do it. I would never say don't set up your own label or don't get into music, but I would say that it's a hard thing to do. If you've got confidence that what you're doing is good and you feel it and it's a, a genuine expression, there's always a way to make it work. It's now possible to make and distribute music very cheaply, so that's great. So maybe you don't need to make as much money from it as you did before to cover your costs. Maybe you can just do it for the love of making some, a beautiful sound and getting it out for the world to listen to. And those who find it and appreciate it are those who do, and that's okay. It doesn't matter really whether it's 10 people or a million people. Well, that fascination was there from an early age. I used to do what my mum called sound and light shows using toy robots and buzzers and uh, old radios and, and, and yeah, my mum sort of appreciating that and saying, giving it a name and uh, being enthusiastic about it, I think was a big sort of boost in the right direction. So I'm still sort of doing the same thing now. Uh, of course, visuals and music have always gone together. Um, Athanasius Kircher, I think, in the 17th century was one of the first people to try and come up with relationships between sound and vision. Um, Leonardo da Vinci also used to do court spectacles with music and lights and fireworks. So, you know, life is a, is a sort of multimedia experience, actually. So it's natural to, to me to try and bring those together. My family uh, is a mixture of sort of artists and scientists. Um, we're music lovers, but my dad was a sculptor and, and painter, and it just sort of always seemed natural to bring these together. And having got onto the sort of hip hop aesthetic of making music by cutting stuff, sampling, cutting stuff up, and reassembling it, and also through synthesis, when cheap computers started to be powerful enough to handle visuals as well. I thought, aha, this is a natural link. What about applying that aesthetic to visuals and then trying to connect visuals and sound together? And at school, I had a simple sound to light unit which used to just flash the lights, sort of triggered by the music. And I just thought it was cool. It was the first time I'd been to India and it was really a mind blowing experience. So the, the British Council invited three UK DJ producers who were Aki Nawaz of Fundamental, Howie B and myself and paired us up with three Indian DJs and the idea was we would swap tracks and remix each other's tracks. But we thought rather than just do an audio mix, it'd be fun to do an audio-visual remix. So we asked if the 
could get perhaps a film to remix, and uh, the, they came back with Coho Naho. Coho Naho was quite a cheesy, sort of Bollywood, modern Bollywood film, and um, we took a song from it. You know, they have these great dance, song and dance routines in Bollywood. We made this piece, and then we did a big party in Bombay, and we mixed in a load of other Bollywood films with some beats underneath and uh, it went off. It was a great experience. We had just had time to visit a record shop in Bangalore and I wanted to get some Indian music but didn't know anything about it. So I asked Aki Nawaz, could you recommend anything? And he pulled out a set which was something like 50 years of Bollywood music on five CDs. He said, this looks pretty good, get this. All right. So I stuck that in my bag and I took it back to the UK. And I didn't do anything with it for about two years because I've always got about this much music to listen to. And then one day I was listening to it, I listened to the first CD. Didn't, nothing caught my ear particularly. I listened to the next CD, nothing caught my ear. I listened to the third one and the first track had a really good sound. And there was a bit of female vocal. Da -da -da. And this good little horn stamp. And so my ears pricked up and thought that sounds good. So I sampled that in, scratched it in off the CD deck, sampled that in. And those became the, the sort of key samples for True School, which was a track we did with Roots Maneuver. And uh, kids, if you're watching, um, good formula, I have to say, for making a hit track is have really good solid beat and then some kind of odd bit of female vocal that always seems to do the trick.